to Keeping It Real with Janine, your guide to living an authentic, healthy life podcast. I endeavor to have inspiring conversations with ordinary people leading extraordinary lives. I'm your host, Janine Strong, and today I'm going to have a fascinating conversation with Robert Whitaker. Now, Robert Whitaker is an American journalist and author who's won numerous awards as a journalist covering medicine and science. In 1998, he co-wrote a series of psychiatric research articles for the Boston Globe that was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. His first book, Mad in America, was named by Discover Magazine as one of the best science books of 2002. And Anatomy of an Epidemic won the 2010 Investigative Reporters and Editors Book Award for Best, Investi- Woo. <laughs> Best Investigative Journalism. It's a mouthful. Robert is also the publisher of the website madinamerica.com. Hi, Robert. How are you? Thank you so much for being a guest on my podcast. Yeah, I'm great. And thanks for having me, Janine. It's a real pleasure being here. Oh, thank you. Now, do you prefer Robert or Bob? Either one's fine. Okay. (laughs) Most people call me Bob. (laughs) Okay, I'll go for Bob then. Now, I read your book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, Magic Bullets, Psychiatric Drugs, and the Astonishing Rise of Mental Illness in America. And frankly, I was blown away. Um, I graduated from UMass Nursing School in 1980, and I was taught that mental illness had causative brain chemical imbalances, and that's what we accepted, that, that drugs... Um, balanced the neurochemical imbalances in the brain and helped you get better. Um, this is a really important topic. So, uh, you know, after while I was reading your book, I thought, oh, I'll just take a chance and see if you'd uh, be willing to come on my podcast and share this information. I think so many people, I don't know what the percentage is, but so many people all over the world are on antipsychotics, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, and the overall general opinion, I believe, still is that these things work. Sure. I mean, this is, uh, you know, the whole story about how these drugs fix chemical imbalances uh, told of an incredible medical advance, if it were true. Mm -hmm. So think about how complex the human brain is and what we were learning, and this goes back to the 80s, what we were being told, I should say, was that researchers were discovering that, say, schizophrenia is due to uh, too much dopamine in the brain and they had drugs that fixed that. And then we heard that depression was due to uh, too little serotonin in the brain and they had drugs that could fix that. Now, if that were true, I think that would be the greatest medical advance perhaps ever, but certainly in the 20th century. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, just think how the how unbelievably complex the brain is. And we were being told they had the molecules that caused these mental states and they could fix it. And it was that story which began to be promoted in the 80s that really launched this expansion of the psychiatric enterprise. So for today, you were mentioning about uh, the percentage of people on psychiatric drugs. Well, today it's about one in five Americans is taking a psychiatric drug on a daily basis. Wow. And um, and that's and of course today we're seeing people take psychiatric drugs throughout their lives. I mean we're prescribing them to kids, and then we see people in the elderly on them. So it's been become so pervasive. Now, we were the first country to really see this uh, enterprise expand in this way, but it's now happening globally throughout Western countries and all. Mm-hmm. So the first question is this: Is it true? Have they found, for example, that depression is due to too little serotonin. And it that that the whole chemical imbalance hypothesis arose from an understanding of not what was going on in people so diagnosed, but how the drugs acted on the brain. Mm-hmm. So for example, going back to the 60s, they began to understand that the first generation of drugs being used to treat the depression, which we called antidepressants, okay. what they did is they increased serotonergic activity in the brain. And we can talk about how they did that. But just for the moment, that's what they found. Okay. We can talk about the mechanism. So they hypothesized that people with depression had too little serotonin. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In other words, that's what the hypothesis was born. But now they had to find out, do people with depression, in fact, 
before going on these drugs have too little serotonergic activity. Mm -hmm. And as early as 1983, the National Institute of Mental Health investigating this question said, we're just not finding anything amiss with serotonergic function in people who are depressed. And in 1998, um, so Prozac gets brought to market in 1988, okay. and it's said to fix chemical imbalances, said mm -hmm. to make people better than well, and this really triggers this explosion in the use of antidepressants. Mm -hmm. and, and there were campaigns, public education campaigns, to convince us that chemical imbalances were the cause of depression and so forth. And here is what is so amazing: in none of it, none of the research trying to find something amiss with serotonergic systems and people depressed was, was turning out positive. So, and in 1998, the American Psychiatric Association, which in essence had been one of the organizations behind this story, in its own textbook said, we have, we have investigated this and we just have not found it to be so. There is no evidence that a disturbance in the serotonergic system is a cause of depression. That's 1998. Wow. By, by 2005, <laughs> with all these publication, you know, public uh, campaigns to inform people of this, 87% of Americans said they now knew that depression was caused by low serotonin. And that speaks to this extraordinary betrayal of the American public. Because mm -hmm. people were told, we knew what caused depression. We had a drug that could fix it. It was a disease, and that's why you needed to take these drugs for life. Mm -hmm. It was all a marketing story. It was not a scientific story. It makes sense, and and I think that's why it gained so much traction is, well, first of all, people are looking for a way to feel better. Nobody wants to feel depressed, anxious, um, you know, not, not together, schizophrenic. Uh, we all want to feel good, and it, it made sense that there's some kind of imbalance. And so I think we all just latched on to, you know, here's, like you said in the book, here's a magic bullet. Here is something that can really help us feel better. Yeah, it did fit into a larger cultural narrative of, of medical researchers finding out a pathology of something and then designing a drug that fit that pathology. In other words, it was specific to that pathology. And, you know, that's the magic bullet uh, story. So it fit into that culture, that cultural narrative, that larger medical narrative. So, of course, we believed it. Why, why would people be telling us something that they weren't finding to be true? Mm -hmm. Unless they were just trying to make a lot of money. <laughs> un un unfortunately, the story is, of course, the pharmaceutical companies were trying to build a market. And actually, the American Psychiatric Association was trying to sell to the American public a new model for thinking about um, psychiatric problems, and one that frankly would make drugs a frontline treatment because that's what psychiatrists uh, were increasingly specializing in, which was prescribing drugs. So it was a way to promote their own sort of importance in this in this marketplace. So, so in your research, are you? Did you get the sense that 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 this is what maybe a, a a turning point for the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist because a psychologist can't prescribe the drugs that a psychiatrist can so if you go back to the 1970s mm -hmm. uh, psychiatry was american psychiatry was feeling threatened they were feeling that their very you know survival was under attack and there were several reasons for that um, one was the market for a sort of talk therapy was being quite, becoming quite um, crowded. You had psychologists mm -hmm. doing it, you had counselors doing it, social workers doing it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And psychiatry really couldn't prove that its own form of uh, psychotherapy and, and, you know, and psychoanalysis, for example, was any better than any of these other forms of counseling. Mm. So that was one problem. Mm -hmm. Then there was a lot of uh, sort of uh, critique of, of modern psychiatry as really serving as sort of a um, uh, um, a social police force for purposes of social control. Mm. They, they, they remove people from society and they put them into mental hospitals. And we had movies like uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which depicted psychiatry as an, an institution of oppression. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. finally what happened in the 1970s was um, twofold. One, there was a famous experiment done by Rosenhan at Stanford in which he sent ordinary college students into mental hospitals, and they said they were hearing one word, thud. And all of those people got diagnosed as having schizophrenia and being admitted to the mental hospital. But they were, oh they were in 
they were imposters. Now, as part of this experiment, interestingly, the other patients said, uh, you're not crazy like us. You guys are imposters. <laughs> but the none of the doctors, none of the psychiatrists identified them as imposters. So this was quite a blow to their diagnosis, their ability to identify a mental disorders. And all of this came, and then the final thing was benzodiazepines were coming to be understood. This is Valium and Librium mm -hmm. as addictive. So now their drugs were under attack as well. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, American psychiatry said, we have to reinvent ourselves. And what they said, if you look at the documents, what is what has such standing in American society? They say it's the doctor in the white coat. It's the infectious disease doctor. Mm -hmm. So they said the way we can uh, rebuild our credibility and and uh, elevate our esteem, uh, the, you know, the, the sense of how society thinks of us is to put on literally a white coat and say we are treating diseases of the brain. So they publish in 1980 mm -hmm. a third edition of their Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and they change in this manual how they're going to conceive of all these problems. Before, for example, depression and anxiety were understood so often to be in response to life events. Mm -hmm. They said, we're going to call these diseases. Okay? Mm. And we're going to call panic a disease. Now, when they do that, the, that's going to start uh, telling Americans, you have a disease of the brain. What do we treat diseases with? Drugs. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to your point. Psychiatry knew that by calling these uh, diseases, they would have a leg up in the marketplace because they would be the only one that would be able to prescribe drugs. And that would become a first line treatment. So it made sense from uh, – you know, some uh, from a guild point of view, an institutional point of view. And of course, the pharmaceutical companies love the disease model because mm -hmm. this was going to open up new markets. But here's the problem. There was no new scientific discovery behind this switch in the conception of mental disorders. It was done for uh, reasons of elevating the prestige of psychiatry, um, uh, basically, that was the reason it was done for, was psychiatry as an institution was under threat. It was seen as not really a legitimate uh, medical discipline, and they wanted to change that. And so they reconceived of all these problems as diseases of the brain. Uh, but unfortunately, there was no scientific discovery behind that reconceptualization. Wow. I mean, this, Bob, this to me is it criminal. I mean, oh. Well, you know, it, 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 it's, it is... Um, Fraudulent. I mean, we believe that medical professionals should be honest in what they know and don't know. And they don't, for example, you don't go to a cardiologist. And the cardiologist tells you you have a, some problem with your heart when they actually can't diagnose that and says, takes this heart medicine. We wouldn't expect a cardiologist to do that. But in essence, that's what happened. And it's really interesting. Um, you see psychiatrists today since the chemical imbalance story has just completely fallen apart, coming up with rationalizations for why they told people they had these diseases of the brain and that these drugs fix chemical imbalances. And they said, well, it helps them understand why they need to take the drugs. And it also helps them think it's not my fault. Well, <laughs> you don't lie to people and say you have a brain abnormality for those reasons. It's still, it, it takes away informed consent. It is still a betrayal for of people. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you when people, now if you look at the reactions to say antidepressants, antipsychotics, they're all over the map. Some people respond pretty well. Some people don't respond at all. Some mm -hmm. people on antidepressants do pretty well long term. The great majority do not. Mm -hmm. But um, my point is, medicine is supposed to be founded on informed consent. And the beginning space would be like with depression. We don't know what the cause of it is. We don't know the biology of it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean there can't be biological factors. They don't know them. Right. And then the second thing with the drug is this: all these drugs, since you don't have a known chemical imbalance, but now you take a drug that actually alters how the chemistry of your brain works. Mm -hmm. The drugs actually create the very chemical imbalances that were hypothesized to cause these problems in the first place. And I can explain that if you like. Yes, and, and please. Be, okay. So <laughs> I almost need a, 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 a chalkboard to I explain I know. This, I was but... thinking of that too. Yeah. <laughs> I need a diagram. So 
Real Actually, quickly. if you'd if you'd if you do have uh, something on paper or something you can uh, send to me, I can put it on the website so that people could look at it. Okay, sure. I, we can put. I can send that to you after here. Great. But, but real quickly, real mm-hmm. quickly, here's how brain neurons communicate mm-hmm. in the brain. In other words, how do messages get sent along these neuronal uh, pathways in the brain? And that's what allows us to think and allows us to move our arms and, and do everything, mm-hmm. basically. Okay. So you have one neuron we call the presynaptic neuron, mm-hmm. and that's going to be almost touching another neuron, which we call the postsynaptic neuron. And that tiny gap between the two neurons we call the, the synaptic cleft or the synaptic gap. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens is the first neuron, the presynaptic neuron, releases a chemical into that gap, which we call a neurotransmitter. Mm-hmm. Then that chemical binds with receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. We say it fits like a um, key into a lock. And mm-hmm. when that happens, that causes the second neuron uh, to fire. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's how uh, these uh, messages get passed along these pathways. Now, in order to have a, uh, and a, one of the chemicals that is very common in the brain is called serotonin. That's one of mm-hmm. these chemical messengers. Right. Now, finally, as part of this messaging process, once that molecule, say serotonin, binds with the receptors, it only binds for a very, 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 very short period of time. And then that molecule either has – is it's removed from that gap in one of two ways. It either goes back into the presynaptic neuron and stored for later use – Hmm. Or uh, an enzyme comes along, metabolizes it, and the metabolites are carted off as waste. Okay, mm-hmm. that's the normal neuronal function. Okay, what an anti what a, a antidepressant, a drug that we use to treat um, uh, depression, like Prozac. Mm-hmm. What it does is it blocks that reuptake, that removal of serotonin from the synaptic. Uh, cleft, that gap, okay? Okay. It prevents the normal return of serotonin to the first neuron. So now it stays longer in that gap. Mm -hmm. It ups activity, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now you're increasing serotonergic activity. But you didn't have a problem before this, but now your brain, okay, your brain says, "Uh uh-oh, there's too much serotonin in, in the synaptic cleft. And the brain has all these feedback mechanisms that are, um, designed to maintain what we call a homeostatic equilibrium, a normal functioning. So what happens when you go on an antidepressant? One, the presynaptic neurons start producing less serotonin. Remember, the drug ups it, so mm-hmm. the brain, to, to try to compensate for this increase in serotonin activity, is going to try to decrease its own physiological mechanisms related to serotonin. Got it. So the presynaptic neurons... Re- put out less serotonin mm-hmm. and the postsynaptic neurons, those which receives this message, they actually reduce their number of receptors for serotonin. They're becoming desensitized to this molecule. So the mm. bottom line is this. Can, can I ask you, I, I yeah. mean, just uh, logically it, it, from the way I'm thinking, wouldn't the postsynaptic up because there there's too much, um, serotonin in the synapse so it wants to get rid of more or no oh no okay the receipt so okay so you're upping the serotonergic activity right it's staying mm-hmm. in the gap okay right. so the think of what can the presynaptic neurons do to compensate for too much serotonin they can just start stop putting out so much right right, right. Mm-hmm. okay now on the receiving end the receptors are like having a lot of different doors okay okay but now they actually want – but now there's too many serotonin coming through those doors, all right, in the receiving neuron oh, because okay. there's too much serotonin. So what they're going to do is reduce the number of doors Okay, got it. in order to you know, prevent this hyper uh, passage of, of messages. Mm-hmm. Got it. Thank okay. you. So Thank what you. you're doing, you're just decreasing physiologically your serotonergic activity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it, think about it. You up it with the drug, your brain, trying to maintain a normal level, decreases its its own production of that activity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So think about this. Depression was hypothesized to be due to too little serotonin in the brain. Right. Research then found out that before you go on a drug, 
you have normal serotonergic activity. Mm -hmm. But after you go on your uh, on on this drug, it drives your brain into a low serotonergic state in terms of physiology, right? Mm -hmm. So it literally induces the very abnormality hypothesized to cause the problem in the first place. And what researchers do, they call this oppositional tolerance. Mm -hmm. And now researchers, are when they're trying to understand why, say, antidepressants often lose their efficacy over you know fairly quick period of time. And over right. a long period of time, there's evidence that they seem to increase depression. But mm -hmm. as they're trying to understand this phenomenon of the drugs inducing apathy, a lack of effect over time, and these mm -hmm. sort of things, they say, well, it may be this problem is that the drugs are causing the opposite effect long term of what was originally intended by giving the drug in the first place. Now, the public never hears about that, but this is what you find in the research literature. Mm hmm. Now, does this have to do with the fact that the brain is compensating and trying to correct the imbalance that the drug is causing. Exactly. The brain is an extraordinarily neuroplastic organ. It has all these feedback loops and monitors that are designed to keep this activity of, of chemical messaging within bounds. Um, and, 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 and so this is a reaction to it. Here's the way I like to uh, talk about this to explain it. Mm -hmm. Imagine that the drug is acting as an accelerator. You're driving a car. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. The drug acts as like as if it's putting your foot on the accelerator. Okay. So, and you're going too fast. It now puts the brake on serotonergic activity. All right. Mm -hmm. Now the problem is your brain is now functioning in this manner. You got one foot on the accelerator. That's the drug. You got the other foot on the brake, which is uh, these compensatory activities, and that seems to be very stressful for the brain. Mm -hmm. It's it's not a it's it's not a uh, a really high level form of functioning. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. But that's what's going on. The brain is trying to compensate and maintain normal activity in response to the presence of this drug. Wow. Now, Bob, what about over long term, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the physical uh, symptoms that start manifesting that are uh, you know, like the tardive dyskinesia in some cases, you know, and not being able to well, think properly, that's that's a brain. But, but you know, other things that happen in the body that start, you know, people start having to have a cocktails of different drugs to manage. Yeah, basically what you're seeing with this is, is if, if we go back to this, and I don't want to be scaring any of your listeners, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and none of this should be seen as a medical advice. Mm -hmm. It's just all in the, uh, in the uh, hope of informed consent. Mm -hmm. What seems to happen is this. So the drugs and this compensatory reaction, compensatory reaction isn't perfect. And some of the compensatory reactions actually sort of burn out. And mm -hmm. what you really end up along these pathways is, 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 a, is a certain level of dysfunction. So the serotonergic system is not functioning quite as it should if you're taking an antidepressant. If you're taking an antipsychotic, you get dopamine pathways that aren't functioning as they should. And because these molecules are important for so many functions, I mean, serotonin, for example, is also found in the gut. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's very prevalent in the gut. So what is happening is these neurotransmitter pathways are essential for so many things. They might be essential for mounting emotional reactions. They might be essential for uh, involuntary movements. They might be uh, actually uh, essential for frontal lobe function, which is our ability to monitor our own actions. Mm -hmm. um, they can cause the, what is known as akathisia, which is an extreme inner agitation. So they can cause these physical ailments. They can dim cognition. They can dim emotional responses. And all those things are related to, in fact, that you're disturbing the normal functioning of these neurotransmitter pathways. And so when you start getting over time these, this, this sort of dysfunction in these pathways, psychiatrists and doctors prescribing these drugs, rather than say, uh-oh, 
my original drug now isn't really doing what it's supposed to do, and it's causing these other functional impairments and these other emotional impairments just now adds another drug, often meant to um, actually counteract the adverse effects from the first one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you might be taking a, an, an antipsychotic, which tends to be very sedating and make you, and often leads to depression. Well, then they'll give you an antidepressant for that. Right. Or, or maybe... Uh, an antipsychotic will actually make you anxious. So then they'll give you a benzodiazepine. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, uh, people end up on these cocktails where they're taking three, four, and five drugs. And when you're on a cocktail, that really should be seen as a failed form of care. There is no research anywhere that says being on five psychiatric drugs at once is a good thing. And that leads to a better long-term outcome. It's really a sign of a failed paradigm of care. But Go into a mental hospital, go into a psychiatric ward. Virtually everyone's on two drugs, three drugs, four drugs. They're constantly changing doses, constantly changing drugs. And that's really a sign of, um, you know, drug treatment failure, but no one wants to look at it that mm -hmm. way. Wow. Um, you know, I was just uh, thinking about, I have so many friends who are dealing with, um, <clears throat> dementia and Alzheimer's in their uh, parents and, right. you know, having to deal with caregiving and nursing homes and feeling guilty and, oh God, I'm just so grateful I didn't have to go through that. But uh, I wonder, you know, how much of this is, is a sort of the long-term spillover of a lot of these drugs? Well, uh, you know, as you mentioned in the opening, we publish, I publish something called Mad in America, a website that's devoted to, you know, looking at these questions. Mm -hmm. We have daily research reports. Oh. And it was, I think it was like uh, about a month ago that one of the reports said that antidepressant use in, increases your risk of uh, early dementia. Mm -hmm. This isn't exactly a surprise. There's been some other uh, studies suggesting the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, Antipsychotics can cause something called a tardive dyskinesia. Mm -hmm. Now, tardive dyskinesia manifests as, as, as a movement disorder. You might see the tongue constantly uh, going around in a person's mouth and, and sort of tremors, et cetera. But tardive dyskinesia is also so, uh, associated with cognitive decline, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, benzodiazepines are associated with long-term cognitive decline. Now, there may be some problems with other drugs, non-psychiatric drugs that are also perhaps lending themselves to an increase in the risk of early dementia. But there's no question, I, I think, that long-term use of psychiatric drugs is associated with an increased risk of early dementia or cognitive decline and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about now in your book, I was reading that uh, when when people are taken off of these drugs, that then they they tend to regress and do worse, and that was kind of used as a reason for staying on the drugs, and that a, an explanation of why the drugs worked, or that they they work because when when you're taken off of them, you regress and you you get worse again. Yeah, this is really coming a lot from the antipsychotics. So if we go back in history, the antipsychotics, these are drugs used to treat psychotic states. Okay, um, they now were, what might be some psychotic states? Well, you might be hearing voices, you mm -hmm. might have hallucinations, you might have a thought that the CIA has put a radio in your teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, so paranoid thoughts. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it's like uh, you might have a thought that you can get in your car and fly. Mm. Um, it's 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 these misperceptions of reality, but come in, in in many different ways. Okay, I mean, hearing voices is actually quite common, is and it's, it's seen as a psychotic state. But many people hear voices and do fine. But anyway, mm. this is what we're talking about. And and so, first drugs for people who had that diagnosis come in in the 1950s. But there's some sense that, you know, they said eight people, and maybe they knock down psychotic symptoms better than placebo, okay? So we start mm -hmm. using them over the short term. But then you have the question, how long should you use them? Right. And so what, uh, psych what psychiatrists did is they ran studies where they had people on the drugs, 
And then what they would do a randomized study where one half was abruptly withdrawn from the drugs and the others were maintained on the drugs. Okay. Now, by the way, this, these studies were only done in good responders because you had to start with people who weren't really psychotic. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you get these good responders and with great regularity, those who abruptly withdrawn from their antipsychotics uh, relapsed more frequently than those who were maintained on their drugs. Okay. Relapse means the symptoms come back. Right. And that was seen by psychiatrists said, see, you take away the drugs, they're more likely to have a recurrence of symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we have to uh, have these drugs long term. But then there were some studies, and this goes back to the 70s, where they looked at people, first episode psychotic patients who were never put on the drugs and treated up with sort of psychosocial care. And those groups actually had better long-term outcomes. So researchers by the late 1970s were coming up with an explanation for why you had these high relapse rates when people were, were, were withdrawn from the drugs. And they said, here's the problem. And it has to do with this compensatory adaptation we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So what antipsychotics do is they block those receptors on the um, postsynaptic neurons. It's like they pour glue into those locks, okay? Mm. So you, you deaden those um, dopaminergic pathways. Now, what's okay. the compensatory reaction? The presynaptic neurons put out more dopamine, and the postsynaptic neurons increase their number of receptors for dopamine. They're trying to become super sensitive, okay? Okay. All right. So that's their new brain. So now all of a sudden, you withdraw the drug. Mm -hmm. Now you're no longer blocking those uh, you know, receptors. The brain is in this heightened state. And so what they said is, uh, you're because the people have been on the drugs, they've developed a dopamine super sensitivity. You've, you've screwed up the dopamine system. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you take away the drug and you have, you have this hyper dopamine state and that does manifest as psychosis. In other words, this goes back to 1978, 79. They were saying that this increased vulnerability to psychosis over time mm -hmm. isn't due to the disease, but is in fact due to the drug. And and the, and the, again, the best way to think about it is this. Let's go back to the car analogy. Okay. So antipsychotics act as if a, a break on dopamine transmission. Okay. Mm -hmm. In response, your brain put, puts down the accelerator. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now take away the brake, which is what happens when you withdraw the drug. What do you got? Mm -hmm. Your foot's on the accelerator. It's out of control. So all of this sort of increased vulnerability to withdrawal symptoms, to relapse upon psychiatric drug withdrawal are related to the fact is that your drug, your brain has gotten used to the drug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, and now without it, it's out of, it's, it's out of sync. It's out of kilter. Wow. So this is part of the trap of psychiatric drugs. You go on them. Maybe they give you some benefit for a time. And so there's a, there's some people do okay on them long term, mm -hmm. but when you try to come off, because your brain has become accustomed to the presence of the drug, you're vulnerable to withdrawal symptoms, which uh, can be la can endure for a long time. Wow. So, Bob, if you can endure uh, somehow the withdrawal symptoms, over time, will your brain return to a normal state? Can it heal itself? So this was this is the big question that is still present, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the answer is yes and no. Okay. Unfortunately, mm. there is some sense that if, first of all, it doesn't seem like it's the same for everybody. Okay. Okay. But there is some sense that let's say you gradually withdraw from the from an antipsychotic, mm -hmm. that the compensatory effect will also gradually ebb. Okay. And that, uh, and then you can go back to say sort of more normal levels of dopamine function. Okay. So that was always the thought. However, uh, let's talk about two different things that are challenging that notion and making it seem that at least in some people, uh, with some significant percentage, the brain will not reset itself, will mm -hmm. not um, fully heal itself. You mentioned uh, Janine, tardive dyskinesia. Mm -hmm. Now, tardive dyskinesia can show up with antidepressants, but it's really common with antipsychotics. Okay. And what it means is, is the basal ganglia 
uh, part of the brain is becoming dysfunctional. That's why you, you're no longer controlling these involuntary motor movements, and you mm -hmm. might get jerky arms or the tongue moving around, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. Now, that is associated with, that adverse effect is associated with an increase in the dopamine receptors, okay? Okay. So you go on this drug, and eventually you're going to get about twice as many dopamine receptors as normal. Wow. All right. Okay. So now you come off the drug. Does the tardive dyskinesia go away? And what they found is in, in many pe adults, it doesn't, especially if you've been on the drugs uh, long term. Mm -hmm. And then at autopsy, they'll look at people with tardive dyskinesia and have been taken off the drug, and they still have these elevated levels of dopamine receptors. So that's an example of a drug causing a serious uh, you know, adverse effect. It's uh, basically causing damage to the basal ganglia. And when that happens, there's a significant percentage of adults, when they come off, it will not repair itself. Hmm. Now, with antidepressants, we're seeing something of the same thing related. And, and, and the canary in the mine here is sexual function. Hmm. So about uh, it's real common when you go on these antidepressants to have some diminishment of sexual function. And it comes in many forms. It might be a lack of pleasure a lack of ability to have an orgasm, mm -hmm. uh, just sort of blunting of interest in, in, in you know, sex. Mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. So the thought was, okay, okay, you, you can come off these drugs and then you'll get that sexual function back. Now, but about 25% of people who've been on antidepressants for any length of time do not get normal function, uh, sexual function back after withdrawing. And this leads to something called PSSD. Post SSRI, SSRI is a type of antidepressant, mm -hmm. sexual dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So you withdraw, the drug is removed, and yet a, a year later, you're still not feeling really sexually normal. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it seems like with increasing time, the percentage that may be affected in this way, you know, diminishes such that maybe five years later, it's a, it's a it's a much smaller minority. Okay. But but that's the best estimate. About twenty five percent suffer it. It's particularly pronounced in people who go on antidepressants as teenagers mm. during a time of sexual development. And the way oh. it was actually discovered was a, a researcher at in the University of Iowa began noticing. Okay, kids start getting put on antidepressants in high school. They come to college. Many of them want to participate in sexual activities in mm -hmm. college. Mm -hmm. They would go to their counseling center, say, I want to go off these drugs. They would take them off, but they wouldn't get their sexual function back. Mm. And that led a, a researcher there to start you know, investigating this. There's now been, I think, at least nine animal studies doing this. And so, for example, if you give rats an antidepressant at a dosage that's appropriate for their body weight, okay. before they – when they're in puberty, mm -hmm. then they become adult rats, mm -hmm. and you take away the antidepressant, and then you monitor their sexual activity, it will be impaired. And the mm -hmm. way they measure it is the male rats won't mount the female rats with the same frequency. Mm -hmm. okay. now, now you sacrifice those rats, and you look at their serotonergic systems, and you find that in those rats exposed to antidepressants, the density of their uh, serotonergic receptors is, in fact, abnormally low. So you've impaired their serotonergic system, and it doesn't heal itself, at least in rats, and that may be the mechanism for what we call PSSD. But there are all sorts of people withdrawing from antidepressants who talk about other sorts of adverse effects that linger. Uh, they can't sleep. Hmm. They feel like insects are crawling on them. Hmm. And all this, uh, ref uh, they have stomach problems. Hmm. And all this reflects um, a continued impairment of the serotonergic system. Hmm. Wow. This, by the way, right now is, is bubbling up into the research literature. The public doesn't hear about it, but it is increasingly becoming a primary concern. There's a big uh, prize that's being offered for, it, for research and sort of more definitive information on what causes PSSD, mm -hmm. what causes these persistent adverse effects. And the real worry, uh, Janine, and I, I think anybody taking these drugs sh should have this information when they decide whether to go on them, mm -hmm. is, is there's, it looks like there's a percentage of people 
where even when they come off, their brains will not renormalize. Mm. And um, so in other words, going on can end up in a trap where they have to stay on the drug. And long-term use of these drugs is associated with impairments of, of, of different types. Right. Wow. Well, Bob, now what about kids? Uh, what about the, you know, these uh, Ritalin and, and the drugs that uh, kids are being put on now? How? Wow, that just sounds to me like... Well, if you, if you, if you just take what we talked about adult, uh, adults, do you really want to be giving kids that, uh, whose brains are developing drugs that will interfere, interfere with that normal brain development? Hmm. You can see it's risky right from the get-go. And here's... here's I, I, I mean, you've actually touched on something that I think is just so outrageous, mm -hmm. so harmful. I, I just can't believe our society is doing it. So antidepressants, for example, uh, they don't even work over the short time in, in kids. In other oh. words, all, all studies of antidepressants in youth under 18 did not mm -hmm. find that the drugs beat placebo, even on the target symptom of depression. Oh, wow. So if you don't have that benefit, all you have is adverse effects, and you also have the problem that they double the risk of suicide in, in, in kids. Oh, wow. So if you're not even getting the benefit, why are you using the drugs? That's a good question. How, yeah, I don't know the answer. How about, how about the long-term studies that we've had of Ritalin? Well, the best study that was done, done by the NIMH, is a study called the MTA study. Okay. It was done in the early 1990s. And when the NIMH mounted this, they said, we do not have any evidence that giving kids stimulants to kids, Ritalin is a stimulant, right. to kids diagnosed with ADHD produces a benefit over the long term in any domain of function on ADHD symptoms, on delinquency rates, on academic achievement, and on, you know, eventually, be, you know, job mm -hmm. uh, things. Mm -hmm. So they do this study and here's what happens. At 14 months, the, so it, w here's the here's how the study is designed. One group gets uh, stimulants designed by ordinary docs in the community. Okay. Another gets stimulants uh, pr uh, prescribed by experts in ADHD. Another gets stimulants but plus behavioral therapy and another gets behavioral therapy alone. Okay. So it's not really a placebo group. Anyway, at the end of 14 months, the group prescribed stimulants by the experts have a slightly greater reduction in ADHD symptoms than the other groups. Okay. And it looks like they're doing better on reading as well. Mm -hmm. So they say, aha, we finally have evidence that giving stimulants to kids produces a long-term benefit. And if you go on the web today, if you're a parent and you try to find out, should I give my kids stimulants, that's the study that will be cited. However, that study continued. Mm -hmm. And as it continues, it's just a naturalistic study. If people are on drugs, they can come off. If people have not have been on behavioral therapy, they can go on drugs. But now it's just going to see how does medication usage affect long-term outcomes. At the end of three years, mm -hmm. researchers reported, being on stimulant was a marker not of benefit but of deterioration. Mm. So by year two to year three, you actually saw the medicated group deteriorating in comparison to the non-medicated group. At the end of six years, you saw the medicated group um, was more likely to be impaired in their functioning, more likely to have juvenile delinquency problems, have greater ADHD symptoms. In other words, they were doing worse. Now, we, the parents are never told about the three-year results or the six-year results. Australia did a 10-year study. They basically found the same things. The medicated kids did worse over the long term. And there was suppression of growth as well. Wow. Quebec did a study on this and they found that kids were more medicated kids compared to ADHD kids, you know, with that diagnosis not mm -hmm. medicated. They were more likely to drop out of school. They were more likely to uh, have another psychiatric diagnosis. So it was negative. Mm -hmm. So stimulants over the short term will cause you help your kid focus better. It'll also maybe make your kid quieter in class. You sort of get this tunnel-like um, uh, vision. You'll become less socially engaged. Mm -hmm. But long-term studies don't show a benefit in any domain. They do show some worries, some things about increased likelihood of other psychiatric problems, et cetera. So why give them to kids? Wow. And if, if parents knew this, if, mm -hmm. if they knew this full scope of the literature, how many would 
medicate their kids. Mm -hmm. And even if they did, wouldn't they try to get them off after a short period of time? I would think so. Now, what about long term of kids who have been diagnosed uh, that aren't aren't on medication? Well, what you find, of course, and just if you're old enough, you can remember this is a lot of kids have difficulties growing up. And so often they grow out of those difficulties. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say that problems disappear, but um, what what you can see is all what you, here's what you see with great regularity. OK. Is if kids who are struggling are uh, treated in an environmental uh, way that helps them maybe eat better, educate better, uh, maybe helps them in social situations, mm -hmm. uh, in, in any way that helps them feel proud of, of themselves in some ways, increases their physical health, um, helps them form bonds with others, like mm -hmm. with a mentor. Mm -hmm. All those things work. They always work, mm -hmm. okay? But mm -hmm. they're harder, right? You yeah, can't just it takes more work. Get a drug. Mm -hmm. You got to change the classroom. Mm -hmm. You got to create music programs. You got to create uh, physical education programs. Mm -hmm. So they, do in other words, if you have a school system that makes a kid go to school for seven hours or whatever it is, and eat a crappy pr uh, processed lunch, mm -hmm. and maybe they didn't get a good breakfast, and mm -hmm. then gives them three hours of homework, that situation is not conducive to helping a kid who's having struggle in the, in the first place. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. can you change the environment of the school? Does it reduce ADHD behaviors? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there studies or are there schools that have, uh, that you know of that have done this, that have deliberately changed their, the environment and their, their program to uh, help people with uh, ADHD? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The most notable one I know that is even, is not being studied it's done by a man named Howard Glasser, and he, he has developed something called the nurtured heart approach. Mm -hmm. And I think the first place he did it in a big scale way was in Tucson schools. Okay. And he, he went into a Tucson school that had high rates of delinquency, uh, very few, uh, you know, a lot of kids on uh, supported lunches, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. not a lot of kids excelling. Mm -hmm. And what he did is he, the principal was behind the idea, and he just changed. He, he did workshops on helping teachers change how they taught mm -hmm. and how they ran their classrooms, mm -hmm. and also, you know, helping kids get up and move around and that sort of. Thing. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say maybe just doing more things that are are yeah moving around rather than sitting the whole classroom. I know, I know a school that basically has kids get up and dance every hour, but okay, and that <laughs> seems to be pretty effective. Anyway, his approach is shown to dramatically reduce um, ADHD, delinquency rates, increase um, academic achievement. So that's an example of a non of changing the environment. Mm -hmm. There was a there was a, a in Appleton, Wisconsin, a number of years ago. What they did is change the diet. Mm -hmm. So they threw out all the Coke machines mm -hmm. and they also started serving real food in their cafeteria. By real food, I mean they, not the processed crap right. that the go government sells, mm -hmm. but it was like fresh bread, fresh fruit, mm -hmm. fresh vegetables, newly cooked. And they taught the kids how to cook as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they made the kids invested in eating well at breakfast. Oh, by the way, they had breakfast as well. Nice. Uh, Eating well at lunch, mm -hmm. knowing about dinner, mm -hmm. and what did they find it there? Well, uh, academic achievement went way up, mm -hmm. and delinquency rates, ADHD problems went way down. Now, why wouldn't everybody do this? Because it's more expensive to serve real food, right? And mm -hmm. you got to have people who, and it, it takes more time to prepare the food. So, you know, we don't do it. So there are solutions. But what you see is a society who, as you used to go back, Janine, to the beginning, who want the magic bullet. Parents want the magic bullet. Doctors want to be able to prescribe something that makes parents believe that there's a solution. And as a result, we as a society don't do these larger environmental um, solutions. Well, you know, Bob, I think we see it everywhere. It, it just look at um, what's happening environmentally. It's short term thinking. Yeah, absolutely. And, and all you know, we started this part of the conversation with, what about the kids? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are many things a society is supposed to do, but one of the most essential, morally important things it's supposed to do is nurture healthy children, help mm -hmm. children grow up and 
you know, be all they can be, be physically healthy, be curious, be emotionally healthy. And we're not investing in that. And we're doing a terrible job at that. If you look at how uh, healthier, physically healthier our kids are, there's a lot of obesity, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. look at their academic achievement compared to other countries, we're very middle of the road. And here's the most amazing thing. 20, more than 25% of our entering freshmen now enter with a diagnosis for a psychiatric condition and a prescription. Oh, God. In many colleges, more than 50% of the student body, by the time they graduate, will seek out mental health counseling. Mm -hmm. Think about that. So basically, we have taught our kids to not be resilient, to, uh, to be anxious, to be vulnerable to uh, depression. It just those numbers, and I feel for these kids, mm -hmm. uh, just mm -hmm. tell of a complete societal failure in in raising healthy children. So, Bob, what would your what would you say? Like, if if a friend came to you and said, "I'm feeling depressed, or I'm feeling anxious, and I'm considering taking drugs," what what might some things? You know, I'd like to leave our listeners with some, you know, what can you do? You know, if you're considering taking a pharmaceutical because let's, you feel like shit, yeah. what are, what are some other options that you should try to do first? Well, well, first of all, I think you should become informed about what the drugs do. Mm -hmm. Just so as you make your decision whether or not to use these drugs, you should become informed. Second, then you can. You can take hope. You can take comfort in knowing that human beings are resilient mm -hmm. and uh, depressive states tend to lift, by the way, on their own with time. Okay. But what, what you can also do things like um, we know that getting engaged with others can be important. Mm -hmm. Sometimes depression leads to isolation. We do know that exercise can be important. We, knew, we do know um, that eating well can be important. It also may be that you're in a crappy uh, job mm -hmm. that's making you unhappy, or maybe you're in a crappy relationship that's making you unhappy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sometimes depression may be a sign that you need to make more fundamental changes in your life as well. Now, and there's all sorts of non-drug therapies. There's CBT. There's um, mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know other different types of psychological therapies. And what we have done at Mad in America is we are create we've already done it for the kids and now we're in the process of doing it for the adults so we're putting up resources on our our site uh, and you can see it right now so far with for the parents which say okay you have a diagnosis of depression and then you can go see here's what you can expect with the drugs this is what research has told us about the drugs and then there's also a page with all sorts of alternatives with information about what what this type of therapy is, what does the research say about it? And so you can start sorting through these uh, non-drug alternatives. But that's the, awesome. Now that's mad in America, all one word dot com, correct? That's that's correct. Okay. And so for the parents that's up right now, you'll see parent resources and you can go through both of these. And we're in the process of building the exact same decision making tree of information mm -hmm. for, for adults as well. Awesome. So, so uh, last thing here, Janine, in terms mm -hmm. of what I would tell someone, it's your decision, of course. Uh, I'm sure you believe in making an informed con uh, an informed decision. Uh, take heart in knowing that so many psycho psychiatric problems are temporary. They're episodic. So you can hope to get well, and then you can sort through these options and make one for yourself. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned that, I think it was before we started the recording, that uh, the root of a lot of these problems is trauma at some point in life. Yeah, on, on this is the data on this is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, and in particular, uh, you, you know the ACE studies. That's the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Mm. Goes back to the '80s. Came out of California, and they just began noticing that kids who early on have a lot of adverse experiences. What might that be? Well, it might be parents who are hostile towards them or mm -hmm. non-caring towards them or parents who are fighting all the time mm -hmm. or it may be just parents are not there and or it could um, be abuse or it could be abused mm -hmm. all those things they show are incredible risk factors later on for depression anxiety panic disorder psychotic disorders poor physical health mm -hmm. and 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 
And so those early childhood experiences are an example of trauma that actually changes your body, changes your brain, changes how you uh, respond to threats in the, in the world. So that data is quite clear. And then if we go forward of events that can happen, you know, when you're teenagers or even later, if you look at women diagnosed with schizophrenia, mm -hmm. the percentage who have been sexually, sexually mm. molested or abused is off the charts. Right, right. So that's a type of obviously a profound trauma. So, so, so it sounds to me, because uh, I know you you need to go soon, that a, a good place for people to start is some kind of modality, maybe EMDR or some something that deals with uh, a trauma, emotional, mental trauma that is stuck in the body, and 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 some something a good place to start is is some kind of modality that helps to clear it before you start trying drugs. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Uh, you know, addressing this sort of past and these sort of uh, happenings, these traumatic happenings that have made you often so sensitive to the world, and, you know, fright or whatever it might mm -hmm, be. Mm -hmm. uh, and dealing with that with that sh surely is good. The only thing I would like to add to that is I, I sort of resist the idea that the problem is all in the person's head, right? In the individual, right? The problem, the problem is also clearly in the in-between spaces. And mm -hmm. By that I mean the spaces that one has to move through in the world. We also have problems where the environments are not healthy, job environments, mm -hmm. housing environments, social inequality, wealth inequality environments, um, all those sort of things. So. If you're an individual where you're struggling in, in, in whatever way, anxiety, panic, depression, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, or feeling crazy or whatever, you, you do – I think it's good to look at your environment and see if things like volunteering can help, mm -hmm. uh, joining a gym can help, uh, going to a book club might help, anything that can get you into a, a more supportive environment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I agree. I think that's I know I have days where I feel down. And if even if I just go into the village and go to the little organic grocery store and chat with people and buy a head of lettuce or something, I feel a lot better. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know there's a program in Connecticut called Volunteers for Psychotherapy. Ah. One, of the th one of the things they do is this. So it's really for people who are poor and uh, say have come out of mental hospitals. Mm -hmm. And this group of psychologists will give you two, uh, an hour free of psychotherapy for every week. And the way you pay for it, though, is you have to volunteer for two hours per week. So maybe awesome. you volunteer with the elderly, maybe you volunteer mm -hmm. at an animal shelter, whatever, with the homeless. Mm -hmm. Now, what, of course, is great is that volunteer work gets people out of the house. Yep. It gives them meaning. It removes them from being the the mental patient that needs to help, and now they're helping others. Mm -hmm. And it also helps them. People say, "What do you do?" Oh, well, I you know I work with the homeless mm -hmm. or I do this. It gives them a place. So the volunteer work, it clearly is therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent idea, and especially if someone is going through difficulties where it's hard for them to hold down a job. And, right. and work, um, at least even though you're not getting paid for volunteering, you're you're getting out, you're helping other people. It, it improves your self-esteem. I mean, all the way around, it's a win-win. Exactly. Oh. So how do people, um, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for how, having how, me. Oh, how do people connect with you or you know what uh is madinamerica.com is there any other any other way that you'd like to share with people or is that the yeah sure, sure um people can go on madinamerica.com mm -hmm. and they'll see a top on the menu bar called con is there's a contact they mm -hmm. just press that and you'll find a way to email me uh that way okay well, and and i'm really good at answering email you can also just email me at R Whitaker at madinamerica.com. So that's my first initial R for mm -hmm. Robert. And mm -hmm. then Whitaker is W H I T A K E R mm -hmm. at madinamerica.com. Um, just email me there and I, and I answer everybody. Oh, that's great. Awesome. Well, I know that the listeners are going to or have gotten a lot out of this conversation. And um, I hope that I really hope people share this because there are just way too many people 
on drugs that they probably shouldn't be on or who don't have any idea what the long-term consequences are going to be. And uh, I'm sure it took hours and hours and hours <laughs> of <laughs> of work to, to write this book and to research. And it, it's very well researched. I, I saw some critics saying, I, I don't know, they had some, what I thought were some pretty stupid criticisms of your book. And uh, I, I thought, wow, I wonder if you're a part of the pharmaceutical industry or something. <laughs> yeah. Listen, uh, when you, when you write a book that challenges conventional wisdom and in a way that threatens, uh, you know, what a medical profession is doing and threatens pharmaceutical interests because that's in essence what anatomy does. It mm -hmm. it looks at the research on long-term outcomes and shows that uh, they're really poor. Mm -hmm. uh, you're you're going to get attacked. So that's yeah. what happens. Yeah. But listen, I haven't seen anybody actually point out anything that I got wrong. Good. Great. Well, I will have on the website, I'll have a link. Uh, I'll just put an Amazon link up to your book and um, it's on Kindle. It's, um, I don't know, is it, is it audible too or? Yeah, it's audible it too. It is. Yeah. I think I decided for some reason to read it. I found that books that have a lot of, there's a lot of research that it, it notations and stuff that all gets read out. <laughs> on audible yes. <laughs> and uh and it's easier to read those books um otherwise i like uh, fiction and you know uh <laughs> or, or historical fiction is uh, what i like for audible so yeah, okay I yeah I'll, I'll put a link on for people and i highly recommend reading the book it really is like i said it really in a lot of ways i hate to say it it's kind of depressing but you know we need to be armed with information so that we can make informed decisions well Jeannie, last thing and then i want to thank you for having me it's, it's depressing, but there's also a message that in if we look at through the history of this, mm -hmm. of people's psychiatric difficulties, recovery rates generally were quite good because there is a resilience in human beings mm -hmm. to bounce back from difficult times, including psychotic states. Mm -hmm. and thank you very much for having me on. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Take care, Robert. Thanks, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you, Robert Whitaker, for an incredible conversation. I know this information is going to stick with me for a long time, and I've already shared it with some of my people, so I'm sure you'll be sharing it too. The podcast website is realjanine.com, where you can listen to and download episodes. There are links to guest web pages, photos. You can sign up for the Real Janine bi weekly newsletter to keep up on new episodes, archives, life updates, and healthy recipes. And once again, remember Janine is J A N E A N. To subscribe to Keeping It Real with Janine, go to iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Do you know people who need to hear my conversation with Bob Whitaker? I'm pretty sure you do. Please share the love. It will only benefit everyone that you share it with. Thank you for listening. Take care and be well.